uh, received his PhD from the Imperial College in London, UK in 1997. And after that, he worked as a postdoc uh, at uh, University of Geneva in Switzerland and also at the University of Rochester in New York. And uh, in, in 2008, uh, he moved to uh, Stephen Institute of Technology and uh, established the quantum information and quantum technology group there. Uh, Professor Jin Yi, uh, his expertise is uh, in quantum information science and also especially on uh, non-Markovian dynamics for open quantum system and also on quantum control. Uh, today he will talk about uh, environment assisted quantum field restoration. Let's uh, welcome him. Thank you very much. Uh, again, you know, I really appreciate the invitation from Professor Wong. You know, this, as I said last time, so this is my third visit to uh, Taiwan University. Uh, today, I think I, I, sh I should mention this one. So here we have an uh, author, it's uh, called Kevin Wong. He actually is a high school student. You know, uh, He participated in Intel uh, Competition in the West, actually, he was awarded a prize for this work. He uh, also, you know, the uh, participated the Mass Olympia team in the US. He's a brilliant high school student. Uh, also, you know, I want to use this kind of example to show, you know, for doing science, you know, not necessarily, you know, it has to be, you know, the uh, PhD student or master, also, you know, you can do science. You know, as a first year uh, undergraduate student. Also, if you work harder, and uh, also for a high school student. So this work, you know, we are interested in environment-assisted quantum state restoration. Because we know that, you know, the, uh, the, the noise is everywhere. So we need some way, you know, to restore quantum state which is essential for quantum computing and quantum information, you know, quantum communications. So here, you know, this is the outline of my talk. So I will just very briefly review the traditional era collection scheme, you know, including the uh, P Peter Schwartz work, you know, the uh, Skins work, and also quantum feedback control. I think the uh, Xi Chen also worked there, you know, in this area for many years. And uh, the, uh, the motivation for this research. Uh, you see, this is really you know, our concentration here. You know, it's not really about the conventional uh, quantum error correction scheme. So in this case, we perform a measurement on the noise. So attracting you know, some information from this measurement, so that we can you know, the improve the efficiency of noise control. Uh, so I will just mention you know, the uh, three relevant schemes here. The first one is called random unitary decomposition. So we use this kind of, you know, this is a not really pleasant uh, you know, word here. So we call EAQSR. So this is called environment assisted quantum state restoration by using this kind of special technique. So Basically, it's just called random unitary decomposition. I will show you, you know, what is it. Uh, here also, you know, I will show you a special case. The limitation of this random unitary decomposition technique and why we can extend this one to the multiple qubits. Because for quantum computing, you know, we're not just, you know, interested in one qubit, two qubits, right? Essentially, we are interested in thousands of qubits. So that's why you have to consider a high dimensional case. Uh, also, you know, I will introduce, it's called a non-RU decomposition. So here is the RU means random unitary. So at the moment, we don't know the meaning of this one. But I will, you know, introduce this definition here later. Uh, so in that case, we can break the RU limitation and extend the scheme into, you know, a much, much wider classes. So in that context, we can also protect some entangled states which are essential for quantum computing. And also I will show you, you know, one particular scheme. 
if we use the weak measurement, which is the more general, you know, is kind of a measurement. You know, I want to measure something, right? Weak measurement is a kind of measurement which can help us to extract information without completely destroying the quantum state. So that's the kind of kind of measurement we are interested in here. So in that context, we can essentially we can apply our scheme to arbitrary quantum system. Okay, so finally I will also outline the uh, the future development, also you know some the uh, interesting work we are working on right now. So that we will turn to this part. Okay, so here you see what we do with quantum computing, quantum information processing. So the word you see which really catches it is noise. So also in quantum optics, noise is everywhere, right? So we are we have to deal with classical noise, we have to deal with quantum noise. So the question in the context of quantum computing is simply how to control noise. So that's why you know the if you look at the history of quantum information science, so quantum computer was proposed in 1985. You know, could be slightly earlier if you look at a different version. But you know, after those like uh, 30 years, why we haven't have a you know a quantum computer? The reason is noise. So this is really somehow the uh, the most important work. You know, quantum control and uh, quantum decoherence are really you know are two most important concepts in quantum information science. So here, you know, we are we have to think about some kind of quantum control is needed. But the question is. How can we perform, you know, quantum control? Because sometimes, you know, you might have a scheme which is highly efficient, but unfortunately, the trade-off is too high, you know, it's too costly. So eventually, you cannot really use this kind of scheme. So that's the question. You know, we have to think about, you know, some kind of scheme which is uh, efficient, efficient, but at the same time, it's still, you know, in terms of the cost, it's still reasonable. So that's the kind of you know the uh, idea you know underlying this research. Okay, so just very briefly going through you know the uh, kind of traditional interaction scheme. So this is called you know dynamic decoupling, which is also I think Professor Gong also you know has a lot of papers on this kind of things. So essentially you just like uh, apply the external pulses to your quantum system. Then you know if eventually you can control the system, but the question is you know you use a lot of pulses. Also, the current scheme are only limited to a few qubits, not really you know like a thousand qubits. So technically you know in principle you can do that, but technically it's difficult. So that's the kind of current situation. So the other uh, you know the uh, I can show you the other one. So here, so this is uh, the very popular one in quantum computing science. You know, uh, eventually we know that. So classically, we know the noise, right? So we know noise is everywhere, including classical noise. Why we have a laptop there, right? We have a classical computer, because in classical, you know, com uh, computer science, we have a well-defined, well-implemented scheme called irreflection. So we allow, we permit, you know, some kind of errors you know, taking place, you know, from time to time. But we can always correct the errors in an efficient way. But how about quantum mechanics? So Peter Schroer also seen, you know, in 1990, they eventually, you know, the invented basically similar scheme as the classical irreflection scheme. So they, you know, the one example here, you know, I can correct the error, you know. The error here may be, you know, the zero can become one. One can become zero, right? So this kind of error. So eventually I can encode, you know, this is called a physical qubit. So one two-state system in quantum information science is called one quantum bit, but it's called a qubit. So here I can, you know, this is a logic qubit, right? So I can encode, you know, a single qubit with uh, three, you know, physical qubits essentially form uh, one logic qubit. So in this way, I can protect the errors. 
but unfortunately you can see the cost protecting one error at least you will have to use a three qubit more but think about like you have a thousand of qubits and uh, in a classical regime you know your bits the carrier for bits are relatively robust so easily to extend you know you have you can have a small system but also you can have a large system but for quantum system you know you have kind of you know technical difficulty here we can think about you know a small system. You can work out you know carefully for everything, but uh, when you extend your system, you see oh, I don't know how to manipulate three qubits, or if you have a larger system, even more difficult. So that kind of situation, you know, in the quantum regime, the task is much harder compared to the work you know in the classical computer science. So this is a kind of thing. I mean, it's essential, it's important. But we have to realize, because we have to pay the price, you know, this really, really uh, difficult issue. So another one, you know, depend on the application. Here is also a quite a popular one. It's called quantum feedback control. You know, classically, this feedback control has become a part of engineering department standard class. You know, not really in physics anymore. Not in the math department. So basically, you know, is a double E department. We know this is a highly efficient and also extremely useful, but in the last 20 years, actually, if you look at the literature, we know this is also become extremely interesting in the quantum information science. So we have quantum feedback control, you know, you can use a quantum trajectory, you know, there's this many applications. So here, I just briefly mentioned, you know, this is also one possible way to control quantum behavior, quantum knowledge. Okay, so that's the way, so you have uh, the put the item here, put the item into the cavity, so then you know you can detect light immediately by item, you know, this is the dissipation from the, the cavity, so you have a detector here, by feeding back information to the system, make a measurement, you know, this is the kind of way that you can uh, protect or you can stabilize the quantum state. So now you see, we know this, the quantum control is extremely important because you can hear something like we talk about quantum science, quantum technology, you know, people even claim, you know, the quantum technology is a 21st century technology. But one thing is crucial here. We have to know how to realize quantum control. Otherwise, it's not technology. It has to be under control. Everything has to be under control. So this is the kind of situation, you know. For the classical system, for the, sorry, for the closed system, so the task is relatively easier. But we know in reality, there's no closed system. So everything, every system is open in one way or the other, right? Even, you know, you have a highly isolated system. But if you want to know something about system, you have to make a measurement, right? You have to put your, you know, measurement device in contact with your system. Then, the system become open. So that's the situation, you know. You can never have a really truly a closed system. So in the case of closed system, you have a Schrodinger equation, the evolution is unitary. So in this case, I will show you later, it's easy to restore quantum state because essentially, which is equivalent to performing performing a reversal operation. This is a kind of, is called a quantum operation. But for the open system, here means the system of interest is no longer isolated anymore. You know, your system is interacting with the environment. The environment can be complex, can be simple, but anyway, the system is no longer you know, closed. So in this case, you can't use Schrodinger equation anymore, right? Instead, you have to use mass equation. So mass equation typically is very complicated. You know? In the last few years, there's a lot of research you know, uh, on how to you know, derive a, a generic mass equation for the n qubit system, how to put control into the formulas. There's many interesting stuff there. Here, I will use a different approach. Without using mass equation, I call this uh, cross operator approach, which, of course, equivalent to the mass equation. But in this way, when you talk about quantum information, you know, in particular here, when we talk to quantum control, so the cross operator technique are, are more convenient. So here I will, you know, try to understand somehow like, uh, you know, 
here, the first. So we just for the closest here, the closest, right? So for closest, you know the uh, evolution. So if you know the initial state, so after a while, you know, you, you have a state which of course typically is different from the original state. Now you have a question, oh, I want to recover my original state. That's easy because simply performing, you know, this reverse, reverse operation. This is the quantum operation. So in quantum mechanics, in quantum information science, right, you can certainly perform the, uh, you know, allowable quantum operation is called, you know, this unitary is represented by a unitary operation in general. I will show you later how to generalize this concept. But for closest, this is much, much harder. Because here, you know, I have a quantum system which is not isolated, which means the system is in contact with the environment, right? So then you see the state of open system. Here, you know, I can think about, I have an item here, item, interacting with the light, with the EM field, right? So the item is called a system of interest. The EM field, the light, the light field is called environment. So in this case, because I'm only interested in the item, you know, item as a qubit, not light here. So the light is treated as a noise, you know, a thermal noise, you know, this quantum noise, whatever, you know. So the case is that when you're only interested in the item, the evolution of the item is not really described by Schrodinger equation, but by the density operator, which means item even initially prepared in a pure state, which means I can prepare my item into a, a superposition of an excited state and a ground state, right? This is a, a perfect qubit. But unfortunately, you know, after some time, you, if you check your system, the, the, the item is no longer in the pure state, become a mixed state because of noise. So you have a mutual interaction between the item and the light field. So that's the reason you see the light, the, the item can capture a photon, you know, emitted by EM field, or the item also can emit a photon, you know, captured by the environment. So you have this kind of mutual interaction. That's the reason, you know, the states cannot remain as a, a pure state anymore if you have an environment. So that's the kind of uh, interesting situation, but also, extremely bad situation for quantum computing. If you think about atomic physics, of course, this is a perfect thing. We need this kind of uh, energy exchange, right? In order to do something. Otherwise, isolated items are just boring, you know, not interesting. But for our purpose here, you, know, you want to be, you know, to, to have a kind of like perfectly, you know, if not perfectly, but well isolated system. So environment is something bad here. So in this case, I know, you know, after three hours, for instance, here, that's the final state. How can I restore this original? Because, you know, I want to the item, you know, to be in a pure state, not corrupted. You know. This one maybe become corrupted after some time, right? I want to recover my original state, how to do that? In general, it's a highly difficult task because, you know, the final state will, can, could be the decompose in this way. So the K, we have a special name for K, which is called a cross operator. This is a, you know, you can easily derive this one. So K is called cross operator. So we know that, you know, by performing a very simple calculation. So we know that if each of K are unitary matrices, then, you know, we can find some way to recover our original state. So that was the idea proposed by Werner and his collaborator, you know, a few years ago. So, which means, although the item is not isolated, but if the system allow us to find this kind of decomposition, then he had a very clever idea of recovering the original state. So this is called are you decomposition? So I will show you, you know, in the next slide, how to perform this measurement in order to discover, you know, to find out the original state. Okay?
So here, you see the uh, quantum, you know, here is a, uh, we just repeat this one. So the environment assisted quantum state restoration with RU decomposition. So this is the idea initially proposed by Werner and his collaborator. Werner, we know, is a very, you know, the uh, popular, you know, researcher in the quantum computation science. So the, the famous state like uh, called Werner state. Here, you know, again, so I just write down here. So if you think about, I have a quantum channel here, I have a quantum channel. So I send the initial state passing through the channel. So at the end of the channel, you know, oh, I found my state, you know, in the case of classical communication, it's similar, right? You send, you know, telegraph. You send one, but the receiver might get a zero. You send a zero, but the receiver might get one. So you always kind of have kind of errors. So here is in the quantum context. I send a quantum state, which is called this one. After some time, the receiver, you know, receive this state. But unfortunately, this state is no longer the same, the same as the original one. So this is the final output. This is the input. So the question is how to recover the input state. So knowing the output and uh, performing kind of quantum operation, how, to, how can we efficiently recover the initial state? So that's the, the idea you know, underlying this quantum state restoration. OK. So, so what is called the uh, RU decomposition here? The random unit tree decomposition. So as I said, each K, just like that, each K is a unit tree matrix. So this is different from the closed system, right? For the closed system, you only have one term here. You know, here, and only have one term. If you only have one term, it means closed system. Just the Schrodinger equation, right? If you write down the Schrodinger equation, the solution to the Schrodinger equation in terms of unit tree matrix, then just one term. This is a trivial obvious. But now, you know, if you have more than one term, which means it's a open system. So the question, you know, how, yes? Could you please clarify uh, the status of this RU decomposition? I think it's a bit new for me. Like if you have a Hermitian matrix, and then you talk about the spectral decomposition, any Hermitian matrix is a spectral decomposition. Are you saying that if you have a CP map mm -hmm. and there is Krauss representation that there always is RU decomposition? No. Or that for certain no. maps there is no only RU only uh, that's right. the first I, I would uh, make a comment here. The first one, yes. This is certainly if a channel can be decomposed this one is a CP map. Mm -hmm. Complete the positive map. But typically uh, here I, I saw in most cases Kn are not a unit tree, just a matrix. That's yeah, it. Yeah. So this is a very special case. If every decomposition, you know, you can show, not every decomposition, which I mean, for every channel, if you can always find this kind of decomposition, right, then life would be easier. But unfortunately, you know, people show actually uh, the theory for most channels. This kind of decomposition doesn't exist. So, which that's why, so that's our motivation. We have to break this limitation, you know. RU decomposition is nice, but it's too limited, too restricted. Is there, can something be said about which quantum evolutions have an RU decomposition? Uh, we don't have a there? complete classification, but we certainly know, you know, for instance, for uh, you know, one qubit case, you know, we know for defacing, we have this kind of channel. For two, uh, uh, two qubits and the defacing noise, uh, we also have this kind of channel. Probably for uh, n qubits, we could also find out this kind of channels. But for dissipative you know, channel, you know, people show this already. You know, more than two doesn't exist. Yeah. But I don't know, you know, you have a different kind of noises, so the classification actually is not easy. Uh, but anyway, you see here that that's the scheme. You know, how, let's see how. I mean, we assume, you know, as I said, this is a very interesting because the the reason I said it's interesting is because if you know this for open system, you have a quantum channel, a noisy channel. The final state 
can be written in such a way. And each K here, each K, you might have you know, 10 you know, operator matrices, or, you know, 20, 100, whatever, but not just one, right? So Y is trivial because Y is mean the open system. So here you have uh, is closest. So you have a, you know, a finite number of cross operator. If each of them you know, is a unitary matrix, then we call this decomposition is called RU decomposition, random unitary. So as I said, you know, typically, this is not general feature. But if we are lucky, you know, indeed, decomposition is a unitary. So what we can do here? So this is a diagram you know, showing how to do this. OK, so you have a system here. Described by rho s here, you know, the s means system. So rho s of t means, you know, you have an initial input after some time, the output is no longer the same as the initial state, right? The question is how to recover the original state. So that's our purpose. Here's the environment. So you have a mutual interaction. So, but totally, if you think, if you combine the system, quantum system, item, right? Item and the light, combining them together, totally is a closed system, right? You treat it, but the question is, uh, you might ask, you know, why can't we just ignore the concept of open system? I always treat, you know, the total system, because in that case, the lab is easier, because we have a shooting equation, right? So why do we bother, you know, we have to come to this one without getting this one? So that's the kind of ideal case, because that assuming, you know, we have an infinite ability, you know, kind of power to solve all kinds of problems. Because the environment typically is very complicated. You know, you have a computer there, right? Computer, you know, after using the well, you feel the, the heat, right? You have thermal noise there. Also, you have kind of electrical, you know, the, uh, the hardware problem, the defect. You know, environment typically is very complicated. It's not really fully under control. I mean, this is the first case. So you have to use the small system, not really using everything, because the information is limited. You know, you really don't know the, the environment. You know some features, but you don't know the details. So that's the one one thing we have to emphasize here. So typically, the environment is much more complicated than system. The second one, environment has a you know you basically you know you have a, so many degrees of freedom, right? So even you know everything, even you know detail. But the question now, if you think about light field, right? The light field contain, you know, like uh, 10,000 nodes there. How can you numerically solve this one? If you want to solve the total system, just too complicated. You know, you know okay, this is a different equation. I know different equation. I know, okay, solve this different is eventually it's possible. But in practice, is it impossible because just take too long time, you know, maybe take like 100 years you know, to solve this one, but it's already too late. So that's the question, you know, we have to deal with this only. The third point is, basically, you only measure the system. You're not really measure everything, right? So that's why, you see, if you can isolate the system, you know, you, you only identify some parameters which are important for system. Then everything, you know, your equation of motion only deal with those parameters. Then, you know, life can be much easier because, you know, you have a much smaller system. In the case of qubit, right? Qubit is a two-level system. You only have a two-dimensional space to deal with. But environment can be, you know, very complicated. But if you know how to deal with system only by using like a mass equation or using this kind of uh, decomposition, Essentially, you can forget about the environment because the information about the environment is encoded here by K as a parameter, as a number, not as you know the uh, the operator. You know, in the case of quantum mechanics, right? The quantum mechanics physical observable are uh, represented by operators. But after you know, if you only concentrate on the system here, then all the all the information about environment, you know, becomes the parameter. So that's the kind of you know trade-off. The although deriving.